Um, I'd like to begin by thanking uh, Valentini for all of her hard work um, putting this together, um, as well as helping me through some tech issues. Um, and I'd like to thank all of you for coming out. Uh, appreciate seeing you. Um, out here, let me start my video uh, just so that you can see me here in my home office down uh, south of Houston. Uh, the title of my talk today is Offshore Energy and International Conflict, an Overview with a Consideration of the Arctic. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the project as a whole. Um, do you know how to stop the dinging noise? <laughs> um, I don't know if anyone else hears that. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about the I'll, I'll try. I'll try to mute it. It is from the people as they're coming. Yes. yes. So <laughs> Thank you. Um, let's talk a little bit about the project as, um, as we get started. Uh, I am a political scientist. My specialty is international maritime law and conflict. Um, so the traditional disclaimer of I am not a lawyer. I just study international law, particularly how international law is made and the politics that go into that. Um, my area of expertise that I like to study geographically is the Arctic. So we're going to have a broad overview of international maritime law. And then we're going to focus on some particular areas in the Arctic uh, where we see a need potentially for policy changes or additional international legal documents to kind of guide state relations and hopefully prevent conflict. So that's just real quick. This is a project I've been working on for several years. Um, it keeps getting interrupted by other projects, unfortunately. Um, so it's one that I return to off and on again. And I was really excited um, when the Energy Institute reached out and asked me to give a talk because it gave me a chance to return to, uh, to what I was working on with regards to offshore energy and international conflict, which is an area that is talked a lot about, but not specifically from an energy perspective as often as maybe it should be. So as, um, as I begin, uh, I'm going to start by talking about the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, which is the international maritime legal document that deals with state control, jurisdiction, and ownership of various parts of the world's ocean. So a couple of things that I want to point out that are little ticks of my particular discipline, since this is an interdisciplinary talk. Uh, you'll notice I tend to use the royal we a lot. <laughs> and um, that's not because I'm saying that you and I did something or need to do something. That's kind of an affectation in international relations scholarship where we're talking about the global community. So when I say we have this treaty, I don't mean that you and I have it, though we do. What I'm saying is we as the global community came together and we created this treaty. So the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea was a huge global undertaking. Uh, it was many decades in the making. Uh, people first started talking about the need for an international maritime treaty uh, to be hosted by the then new United Nations back in the 1940s. Uh, they tried doing some negotiations in the late 40s, early 50s, didn't work out so well. They tried doing it again in the 60s, that worked even less well. And then they tried again the third and final time in 1973. And those negotiations uh, involved over 100 countries and lasted until 1982. And the final document was called the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. It went into effect in 1994 when it finally had enough ratifications. And it is today the premier, uh, the, the premier international legal document when it comes to country relations over the world's oceans. So really brief overview. Um, what it ends up doing is breaking up the ocean into different sections. And in each of these sections, you have different kinds of rights and regulations that go along with the coastal state. So what we're talking about here are coastal state responsibilities. So that state that in this map is off to the left. Um, the baseline is always drawn for all of these things at the low tide mark. So from the low tide mark on out. 
three nautical miles out is where we see the first one right here. That's usually state jurisdiction. So um, what I mean by state jurisdiction is like provincial or in the United States, they're states, um, but usually local of some sort kind of management, not entirely. Doesn't, you know, it depends on, on the world system. Um, different countries have different laws, uh, but at least in the United States and other countries, often the three nautical miles. So three nautical miles out from the baseline is regulated by the state of Texas. From the zero baseline to 12 nautical miles, however, is called the territorial sea. That is state, the country's waters. Um, you have full sovereignty in these waters. You can do basically whatever you like in terms of regulating them. You can um, have any sort of rules, laws to protect those waters, to exploit those waters, to do basically whatever you want to, to the water, to the seabed underneath, and to the airspace above. That's all part, basically part of your country. And so there's only one right that you have in there um, that can't be limited by the coastal state, and that's the right of innocent passage. Innocent passage is if I'm trying to go from point A to point B, and my route from point A to point B leads through your waters, your territorial waters, as long as I'm not hurting anybody, as long as I'm not doing anything illegal, as long as I'm not causing any problems for you, I'm allowed to transit through. I'm not allowed to stop, I'm not allowed to dilly-dally, I'm not allowed to take my time, but I can go through. So after that, you have another 12 nautical miles. That would be the 12 to 24 thing up here, the contiguous zone. That's basically a special custom zone uh, where if you see ships out there that are going to potentially be entering the waters of your country and you don't really want them to or you're concerned that they are involved in illegal activities and you'd like to check that first, um, then there's limited boarding rights uh, in order to make sure that you're not smuggling drugs or human trafficking or things like that in those regions. The contiguous zone is part of the larger overall exclusive economic zone. The EEZ is kind of a weird area in that you don't have rights to the water but you do have sovereign rights when it comes to managing, exploiting, or protecting the living and non-living resources of the water column. So if you wanna control fishing, say, I wanna let anyone who wants to fish come into my EEZ and fish. You have the right to do that. If you wanna say, I want no one to fish in these waters, not even my country, you can say that too. If you want to, which most countries do, want something in between, you can engage in all sorts of licensing rules, regulations, whatever. What we're gonna be focusing on today in this talk are the rights of the continental shelf. So out to 200 nautical miles underneath the exclusive economic zone, you have sovereign rights for exploiting the living and non-living resources of the seabed and the subsoil. Uh, just to be real quick, there are living species that are covered under the continental shelf regime. That's basically anything that's sedentary that doesn't swim, that's connected to the continental shelf. So crab are a good example of that. For the most part, we're going to be talking about the continental shelf because this is going to be a talk that's focusing on offshore oil. And that's where we find the offshore oil is in the continental shelf, not necessarily in the water above it. So out to 200 nautical miles, you have the right to go drilling for oil if you want to. Um, if you think there's something out there to go mining in the deep seabed, you can go do that too. Um, but right now, majorly, we're talking about offshore drilling. Now, here's where the fun part sits in. After 200 nautical miles is the high seas, which is beyond national jurisdiction. Anyone can go out into the high seas and take advantage of the resources that are out there. Underneath the high seas is the deep seabed um, on this map and in international law, it's referred to as the area, mostly because the United Nations likes to be confusing. Um, but you'll notice there's this weird little section in between the high seas and the area and the continental shelf where the arrow goes on. This is an area that we're going to be talking about a lot in this talk today, which is if you want to as a state, you can file a petition to the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf, 
which is a UN body that was created by the United Nations Convention on the Law to Sea. And you can say, look, my continental shelf goes out further than 200 nautical miles. I have all of this scientific geological evidence that says my continental shelf goes further. And so I want an additional 150 nautical miles of my continental shelf that I can regulate, take care of, um, exploit, what have you. So you have to file this petition within 10 years of ratifying the UN Convention on the Law to Sea. And then the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf usually takes quite a while um, to consider the petition. They may ask you for more information. They may ask you to revise your claim, depending on what they make of the scientific evidence. Um, and then they'll hand down a ruling that either says, yes, you're entitled to more, and you can have that additional 150 nautical miles to bring your continental shelf out to 350 nautical miles from shore total, or they'll say, no, the scientific evidence isn't compelling. The interesting thing about this region is that for these last 150 nautical miles, we're talking about an area where you have the right to exploit the seabed, you have the right to exploit the continental shelf, but you do not have any obligations or responsibilities for the water column above it. This is high seas above, and then it's private territory of the state below. And that's kind of a weird combination of events that we're going to talk about more in a little bit. After that, you have, um, like I said, the area in the high seas that are all subject to international jurisdiction. Um, not really a lot of rules and regulations for the high seas. We are working on a high seas treaty currently in the United Nations. It's one of the things that um, kind of derailed this project a little bit as I'm following that treaty process. Um, but we, uh, at least right now, don't have a lot of regulations about high seas activities. Uh, the area is registered under, the, administered by this International Seabed Authority, which is an organization that was created by the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. So we're here today to talk about offshore energy. And um, from an international perspective, uh, this could be a very short talk if we wanted it to be, because frankly, most international offshore, or most offshore drilling platforms and drilling rigs are within the 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone slash continental shelf space that has already freely given to countries under the United Nations Convention of the Law to Sea. Uh, I chose to show a picture of the uh, offshore rig Holly here. It's off the coast of California. Very, very, very close to shore. Um, looks like you can swim to it. You can't. Um, but when you're standing on the beach, it just looks really, really close by. Um, so if you wanted to focus just on national drilling or even subnational drilling like California drilling or Texas drilling or things like that, you absolutely can. I am an international relations scholar, so I chose to focus on the international section um, as well as considering some of the future possibilities for international action, which is particularly relevant for the Arctic. Uh, but I want to make sure that I make it clear there's a huge body of scholarship out there that has to do with national drilling laws, rules, regulations, um, and that's very, very interesting. It's just not my area of expertise. What is my area of expertise is this international law. Uh, and one of the things that I always like to make sure that I hammer home as much as possible whenever I'm talking to a group who's not familiar with international law or may not be familiar with international law, it is slow, very slow, ridiculously slow. That example I gave of the UN Convention of the Law to Sea where they first started talking about it in the 40s, didn't finalize it till the 80s, didn't go into effect until the 90s, it's pretty common that these treaties take a very, very long time. The treaty negotiations that I'm watching, for instance, on the high seas, they first started talking about in the early 2000s. They began negotiations for in 2018. Uh, right now, the negotiations are kind of on permanent hiatus due to COVID, um, but they'll pick back up again. And that's considered to be a fairly speedy treaty. So keep in mind, law is slow. 
because law is slow, what we want to do is think about it before we need it so that we are prepared potentially to draft and think about what needs to be in the draft of an international legal treaty before it becomes a problem or before it really takes off as a problem. And this is difficult because while law is slow, technology is fast. I know some of you out there in the audience are more interested in the technical side of things like drilling. And so you know this, right? That we have uh, a lot of capabilities and every year we have more and more and more capabilities. Back in uh, 1982, when this treaty was finalized, I think we had like maybe two deep water rigs and now we're into ultra deep water. So we're talking about many, many, many thousands of feet of water that we can drill in if we want to. But that wasn't a thing when we wrote the first law. We need to make sure that we're proactive and we're thinking about the future and we're trying to figure out what our needs could possibly be before we actually get to the point where we are in trouble and we need to look to law to solve it. I am going to turn my focus now to the Arctic and focus on three particular areas where we could have potential conflict between states. What I want to make sure that I am clear about while I'm talking to you guys today, I don't believe there's going to be a giant shooting war in the Arctic anytime soon over offshore energy or frankly anything else. But there is the potential for a lot of conflict in a more minor sense, that is, the kind that doesn't happen with guns and bullets, but the kind that happens diplomatically, the kind that happens legally, those kinds of conflicts. So I, I hope it, um, I hope that you're not thinking that we're gonna have some giant war in the Arctic over the offshore resources that are out there. That seems incredibly unlikely for a multitude of reasons, but there are areas where there is potential for states and countries to come into conflict with each other and have major international diplomatic issues that spring up. I'm going to focus on three of these. The first is, okay, let's move into the Arctic. I wanna talk a little bit about that special water column problem. So we have five Arctic Ocean states. These are five states that have coastlines that border the Arctic Ocean. That would be the United States, Canada, Denmark, because of Greenland, Norway, and Russia. So those five states all have coasts that border the Arctic Ocean, and so they have rights in the Arctic Ocean under the UN Convention for the Law of the Sea. Now, if you want to file an extended continental shelf claim, if you want that extra 150 nautical miles, you have to have ratified the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea, because that's what gives the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf its power. Four out of the five countries have ratified the Law of the Sea, and put forward a claim under the Commission of the Limits, the Continental Shelf. That would be Canada, Norway, Denmark, and Russia. The exception is the United States. The United States has not ratified the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea. We accept it as uh, international customary law, so we follow the principles of the Law of the Sea, but there are some particular aspects with regards to profit sharing on deep sea mining and a few other areas that the United States has problems with. And so it's never been formally ratified by the Senate. Because of this, the United States is not able to make a claim to extended continental shelf space, which generally speaking, um, most international lawyers and American lawyers who are interested in what's going on up in the Arctic think that that's going to be problematic when everyone else up there has made a claim except the United States. Of the four countries that have made claims, only one of them, Norway, has had their claim actually adjudicated so far by the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf. Uh, the other three, uh, Canada just filed last year, uh, Russia and Denmark filed several years ago, um, but they're still being considered. Uh, there's about 85 claims total that have been filed by uh, various countries having to do with the uh, Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf to extend continental shelf space. This is also assuming that those additional 350 nautical miles, uh, the additional 150 nautical miles that brings it out to 350 
uh, don't conflict with each other. And that's where the commission has to go through and make sure that Norway's claims don't impinge on potential uh, Danish claims or impinge on potential um, Russian claims. Uh, for example, Russia, the United States, the United States, Canada, Canada, Greenland, um, all of those things, they wanna make sure that they can figure out who has the best geologic case for showing that the extended shelf should belong to that country. But again, if you get an extended continental shelf space, then you can um, potentially be drilling in that 200 to, 100, uh, to 350 nautical mile space where you have control of the seabed, but nobody has control of the water column above it. And this is potentially problematic because what happens if that rig or that platform has an accident or something happens to that water, there's no clear jurisdiction over who has to clean it up potentially. There may be state jurisdiction. The country itself may say, okay, if you are an American company or if you are a country operating in American continental shelf space, then we have legal guidelines, but that's all from a domestic perspective. There's nothing out there from an international perspective. And that's potentially problematic because we're getting better and better every day at extracting offshore energy uh, and we can move further and further and further and further afield. Now in the Arctic, this is gonna be a long time coming, mostly because drilling in the Arctic is expensive and dangerous. And right now we probably have the technology that we can do a lot of this stuff, but what we don't have is the willpower. Um, oil prices just aren't good enough to make up for the tremendous expense of drilling in a pretty environmentally hostile region. Uh, but of course, that's something that can change at any given time. Um, oil prices fluctuate up and down with fair regularity. So we want to make sure that we have this loophole kind of closed before we have a lot of countries moving in there potentially to engage in this kind of behavior because if something goes wrong, then we want it to be pretty crystal clear under international rules and regulations, who's responsible for what. And there's a lot of makeshift laws that cover that, but it would be nice to have an omnibus rule that kind of came in and, and dealt with those features. Next up has to do with spills. Uh, so this is a picture of the Deepwater Horizon spill which did not take place in the Arctic, but rather in the Gulf of Mexico um, back in 2010, probably the most famous oil spill uh, of recent memory. Excuse me. And so then you have oil spills. One of the things that we know about maritime waters is that they don't really respect country boundaries. So if something goes in the waters, whether we're talking about the fish that naturally live there or the oil from a spill or a blowout like Deepwater Horizon, it's not necessarily going to stay in one country's waters. With Deepwater Horizon, we got lucky. The location of where it happened meant that the entire thing was under United States jurisdiction. And we didn't have any sort of international complications, but we could have. Theoretically speaking, what we could have seen happen is the water enter the loop current go down to uh, Cuba and cause an international incident that way. Worse, go from the loop current to the Gulf Stream, go straight up the coast of the US and Canada and over to Europe, and then we'd have a large international problem. Neither of those things happened. Deepwater Horizon was a terrible, terrible accident, but it was confined to one country. And so one country had the responsibility for cleanup. One country had the responsibility for regulations. And whether or not you agree with what the United States did in response to Deepwater Horizon, there is absolutely 100% no doubt that it was much easier to handle because it was just one country. But what if it's not? Uh, and this actually has happened before. This is not a hypothetical incident where, oops, we could potentially have an oil spill that goes into another state's waters. Uh, it happened in 2009 with the Montara well, which was in Northwestern Australian waters. Um, the Montara well 
was far enough out from Australia that when it had an accident, um, some of the oil went into Indonesian waters. So Montara was an international problem. It was oil in the Australian water, there was oil in uh, Indonesian waters. And there weren't guidelines on how to deal with this. So what ended up happening was Indonesia goes to the International Maritime Organization. That's the body of the UN that deals with shipping and pollution regulations and said, hey, we had this oil spill happen and there's no international legal guidelines for liability or what reparations should look like or what the state responsible should have to do with regards to cleanup. And we think this is a big problem. And unfortunately, the IMO and a lot of the states that were in the IMO really didn't have an interest in creating a legal treaty to deal with those things at that time. So what ended up happening with the Montara well is Australia conducted its own investigation, found, surprise, surprise, that um, most of the oil stayed in Australian waters and only a real limited amount of oil, I think they said 5% or less, entered Indonesian waters and that the Indonesian fishermen who were complaining that the oil was hindering their livelihood and um, affecting their catches, that they were exaggerating. And Indonesia, of course, strongly disagreed with that, but in the absence of any mechanism to protest, other than the typical great power ways of protesting, threat and force, cut diplomatic relations, really, really um, dangerous and uh, final things to do, there wasn't a lot that Indonesia could do about it. Um, and they really didn't like that. They were very unhappy. They continued to raise the point that we would need a treaty at the IMO for many years after the Montara well accident. Um, so we can definitely see these things happening potentially. In the Arctic, it's also potentially hazardous to think about spills and other accidents because of the hazardous weather conditions. So this is one of my favorite pictures. Uh, it has to do with iceberg lassoing which yes is a thing when you drill in the north um basically uh this is a picture taken off the coast of nova scotia slash new brunswick newfoundland that area um, where the greenlandic ice shelf has been melting and putting icebergs in the water so in 2018 they had a lot of icebergs under the water and that area off the coast of Canada has a decent number of offshore rigs. So they sent ships out to physically rope these icebergs off and make sure that they were out of the path of hitting a platform so that there wouldn't be a spill or a blowout. So this picture is taken as one tugboat is shooting the rope over to another tugboat so that they can then drag this giant iceberg out of the way of uh, potentially hitting an offshore rig further south. And take a look at how big this iceberg is compared to the people on the ship in the, uh, the foreground. Like this is a gigantic iceberg. These kinds of ice related hazards are going to be a big deal um, when it comes to making sure that the environmental safety of a rig or platform is sound. And it's just a special hazard that you're going to have to deal with. But as ice melt continues up in the Arctic spaces, um, you're going to see more icebergs as ice sheets calve off glaciers, um, calve off uh, icebergs from into the water. And, um, and so you're going to have to see more and more difficult maneuvers like this and expensive maneuvers like this, or you're going to see spills. Um, you have one of those two things. In 2018, a rig off of the coast of Canada was almost hit by an iceberg. Um, and that was just in Newfoundland. We're not talking about going further north than that. So uh, it, it is a very real danger made even more real by the fact that um, you have these special hazardous environmental conditions. It's also worth pointing out that, again, just like you have currents that can take the water in the Gulf of Mexico around, you have similar currents that take water in the Arctic around. So if you were to have a spill, uh, depending on where it was, it could quite easily become an international problem. For instance, 
Uh, the United States and Canada have several undemarcated international maritime boundaries, I think four last time I checked. Um, one of these is the Arctic boundary on the west coast of Canada or the western part of Canada slash Alaska for the United States that would be a continuation of the land border between Alaska and the Yukon territories. There's a pie-shaped wedge that is claimed by both the U.S. and Canada. If we were to have offshore drilling off the north slope of Alaska in the waters out there, we could very easily see um, potentially ice uh, or potentially oil enter into these kinds of waters and um, be problematic given that there are disputes going on in that region. And the same thing is true on the Canadian side as well. If they wanted to drill and it entered into those waters, it's problematic. One of the long diplomatic problem or concerns that Canada's had is the idea of drilling off the western coast of Greenland, which is very appealing to many in Greenland because offshore drilling is seen as a way to ensure Greenlandic economic independence and thus potentially political independence. Right now, Greenland is economically dependent on Denmark. But a spill in the western coast off the western coast of Greenland would, because of currents, go straight into the Canadian archipelago. And so Canada is vehemently against this because they see themselves as potentially getting stuck with the cleanup. In particular, um, this is seen as an environmentally sensitive area. It's given special, um, coastal countries are given special jurisdiction to protect the environment of ice covered waters under the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea. And so there's this special idea, this, there's an idea that we should have special protection rights because the environment up here is both hazardous and sensitive and fragile. So drilling in these waters would have to be really very strongly considered um, from an environmental perspective before we did it. And the last potential issue is um, dealing with the human life. Uh, if you have any sort of human activities in the Arctic, that means that you have humans up there. And that means that you have humans up there in an area that is very difficult for the sustenance of human life without a lot of help. So um, what if something goes wrong? We have um, a long history of determining that we have a responsibility, we the global community, have a responsibility to protect people when they're at sea. This dates back to the Safety of Life at Sea Treaty, uh, which was first written and uh, finalized in 1914 after the Titanic, when people were like, oh yeah, if you're going to have people out on the ocean, you need to make sure that if something happens, they don't all die. So early, the early versions of the Safety of Life at Sea Treaty dealt with all of these things with um, how do we protect people. In the Arctic, this is particularly relevant because you'll die within a matter of minutes to exposure to ice water. Um, you really need to be able to act fast if there is an accident. And because of this, the very first uh, legally binding treaty that was passed in the Arctic by uh, a group called the Arctic Council, which consists of the eight states that have territory within the Arctic Circle. So the five I mentioned earlier, the US, Canada, Denmark, Norway, Russia, but also three extras, Iceland, Finland, and Sweden. These countries have come together and created a search and rescue treaty because they realize that international cooperation is a necessity to save lives if something goes wrong in the Arctic. And uh, this is particularly important because if you're talking about offshore rigs, you could be hundreds of miles from shore. And depending on where the rig is, literally thousands of miles from the nearest real hospital. So um, you wanna make sure that you have plans involved for how to keep people safe. This picture here is, uh, taken by the Finnish border guard of a joint exercise between Finland and Sweden dealing with search and rescue. But you wanna make sure that the human life is protected as well as the environmental life. And you don't want to be in a position where countries are blaming each other because of a lack of cooperation led to potentially um, someone being hurt or someone dying or multiple someone's being hurt or someone dying. 
Because the fact of the matter is, we know that accidents happen. Um, accidents are a part of human life. We can have the most perfect regulations, we can have the most perfect procedures, we can have the most perfect everything, and we can still run into accidents. So this last picture is from 2012. This is the Culloch rig, which was being towed by Shell out to um, offshore in Alaska to uh, begin exploratory work out there. And the ship, uh, ship's towing it and the rig ran into a storm. During the storm, um, the line snapped because it was a hazard to the ship as the rig was being battered about in the, uh, in the storm and the rig ends up running aground. Now it wasn't operational, so there was no big spill, there was no big blowout, but it did result in the absolute destruction of the rig. It took them a while to get it off the coast and then they had to send it off uh, to be scrapped because it just couldn't be repaired to uh, an appropriate level for uh, reintroduction into production. So that was an accident, that was just a giant storm. And it was a very, very safe accident as far as these things go. We had relatively minor environmental damage because the rig wasn't in production yet. The only fuel was the fuel that was actually already on board. Um, and so um, because of that, uh, you have to keep in mind that you can't predict every single kind of behavior. Now, that was in 2012. Um, we had a big oil crash and there's no longer a lot of interest in drilling up there because of the prices of oil, uh, but we always can potentially have issues and they're very difficult to figure out how we're going to clean up, how we're going to keep people safe, how we're going to keep the environment safe, um, how we're going to engage in safe energy extraction. And this is something that while I've talked about it with regards to offshore oil, we could talk about with regards to other forms of offshore energy as well. Um, my favorite is the recent plan by Russia to install an offshore floating nuclear power plant uh, off the coast of Murmansk, which is in the Russian Arctic, uh, relatively near to Norway, and the most populated city in the Arctic Circle. So they want to put an offshore floating um, potential nuclear power plant, which could also lead to some environmental issues, obviously down the line as well, just because we have um, the most developed industry in offshore oil energy doesn't mean that it's only going to be valuable to do this for the offshore oil industry. Uh, with that, that's just a really brief, quick and dirty overview of um, some of the issues that I've been working on and figuring out what kind of solutions uh, people have already put into place and what potential solutions we could think about for the future in order to prevent offshore conflict over energy. Um, I'm looking forward to your questions. I can't promise to answer all of them, but I'm really uh, hopeful about your feedback and looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you all so much for listening and coming out to this today. I really appreciate it.